Good afternoon. Uh, we are from PEX, Princeton Energy and Climate Scholars, and I think just start off and introduce ourselves. I'm Tristan Holman. I'm a mechanical engineering grad student, and my research is in the interaction between the atmospheric boundary layer and vertical axis wind turbines. Um, on my right is Gita. I'll let her. Hi, everyone. I'm Gita Prasad. I'm a second year graduate student in atmospheric and oceanic sciences, and my research focuses on aerosol um, interactions with the climate. So there are lots of sort of policy implications and ethical implications with the work that I do. And I would love to, if any of you have students or are students who are working on sort of the interface of climate and environmental issues and ethics or philosophy or policy, I would love to be able to talk to those people. And then we have DJ on my left. Hi everyone, I'm DJ Bojum. I'm a fourth year graduate student in chemical and biological engineering. Uh, my research focuses on high energy density supercapacitors and I'm using advanced carbon materials to try to accomplish that goal. So getting into the presentation, it's kind of a public service announcement. This is what we do, um, so bear with me. Um, so what is PEX? PEX is Princeton Energy Climate Scholars. Uh, we were founded in 2008 and it's a student-led group with supervision from a core group of faculty members. Um, the members have an interest in climate and energy science and it's mainly the idea is to have a forum to interact across a broad range of uh, fields so that you can get a taste of what other people are doing and how it all fits together in the big picture. So who are we? We have 17 current members um, from, and 14 faculty members. And you can see that we come from a diverse departmental background, maybe not as diverse as we'd like, and hence today's discussion. But a lot of engineering, uh, economics, geosciences, uh, financial engineering even. Um, PEI is heavily involved and then Woodrow Wilson School for Policy. So what do we do? Um, one of the main things that we do is have uh, small and formal discussions among members and faculty. Um, once a month we have a student research uh, dinner where we'll all get together and one of the students will present uh, a part of their work and we can talk about it and discuss it and get a little more familiar with the things that each of us is doing every day. Um, that also involves lab tours, so we get to see a lab that maybe we haven't worked in before. Maybe some of us don't even work in labs, so seeing what goes on in the laboratory environment can be enlightening. And then also once a month we have a faculty uh, discussion, where one of a visiting faculty or a faculty associated with PECS talks with us over dinner about their research and their interests, and we get to see not only what our fellow students are looking at, but what also the faculty in the field are looking at. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a good forum to try to get interactions between different departments and maybe someone's working on something very similar to you that you had no idea of, and it's, it's really helpful in that sense. So then, in addition to that, we try to do a lot of outreach activities, um, meet with visiting scholars, we post uh, regularly to Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, and do blogs based on the events that we do. Um, there is some interaction with the undergrads on campus. We've had partnerships with Engineering Without Borders and SEEDS. Um, and also, most recently, uh, Gita has been trying to spearhead a interaction with even high school students to get them interested in environment and climate, even younger age. Um, last year, or last summer we had a trip to Rio Plus 20, the UN uh, kind of big conference for, uh, for the environment and everything like that. And on that note, let me just show you a quick video that we did. I've been to uh, Rio Plus 20 for uh, the last couple of days now. And uh, it's been very impressive that we have a representation from uh, what they call here civil societies. So that these are non-governmental organizations and uh, non-for-profit. So uh, we have uh, side events where uh, those organizations can come together and hear uh, whatever issue uh, they promote, maybe environmental justice or uh, the uh, improvement of uh, uh, electricity. Uh, so yesterday, after our side event, I uh, went to, with Mary, 
an event on uh, small island states and what we could do there. This was put on uh, in part by the Climate Institute. They ended up having uh, the president of Aruba was there. There were a few other uh, high-level officials as well as uh, Sir R Richard Branson of uh, Virgin. And they were announcing a new initiative for by 2030 to make uh, at least Aruba 100% uh, renewable energy. And it seemed like a nice, exciting time. It was the first time actually at uh, Rio Plus 20 that I actually seen any kind of goals or anything that was going to be done. Uh, so it was kind of like, oh wow, what a change. This the whole Rio Plus 20 UN conference has been incredibly exciting for me. I have at least two very memorable moments. One was after this um, side event on Forest Street, there, I got invited to go to a dinner. We were at a room behind one of the um, main well, the main cafeteria, and I really felt like you got there's a lot of things that are going on that we're not being able to see, and all of these are very important. So I think one of the things that I've really gathered from this is how important it is for scientists to be involved and to be knowledgeable about what's going on on the policy side of things. So for example, today we were in a high-level panel put on by the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, and one of the topics they were talking about was the need for scientists to know what questions the policymakers are asking. And so as a young scientist, I would really like to be able to understand better at these conferences how I can find out what the real questions uh, that are being asked by the policymakers are and how I can contribute. That was a short video of some of our reflections from the Rio Plus 20 conference. And then getting back into So that was the Rio Plus 20 reflections. Um, and then one of the final things that PEX members do is there is a yearly collaborative project. So that ranges from uh, we had recently in past years done a paper on an equivalent emissions, basically what are the effects of some uh, non-carbon um, pollutants in the air. Um, there was a commentary on Princeton Energy China Forum. Um, climate negotiations in Cape Copenhagen and the ARPA-E Energy Innovation Summit. Um, you just saw the Rio Plus 20 trip and outreach video commentary and reporting that we did throughout the whole uh, Rio trip. And this year we are uh, working on the possibility of a trip to India, um, working with an NGO there uh, towards implementing an uh, energy plan for campuses in India. Um, that's still in the works, so we're not 100% sure of that. But So then why is PEX as a society valuable. Um, I think the main value that its members take is the interdisciplinary exposure. Um, you're exposed to more than just your field. As, as a graduate student, you kind of get put into a very narrow, focused research project, and it can be easy to not see what the broader implications of your work are and what other people are doing in similar fields. Um, it, it strengthens your ability to handle these energy issues by knowing what the issues are from a variety of different perspectives. Um, it encourages uh, research. There's a uh, travel fund that each member has available to them to go to uh, conferences that are related to energy and climate. And basically, for your overall career plan, it's good to broaden your perspective on subjects and you get work with industry, government, NGOs and the UN at Rio, for example. So it, you get a broad background that you can build upon for the future. So why are we here? We need to expand our boundaries. Um, Ken, a month ago, about gave a talk here in this very room, two cultures of environmental studies and how they've drifted apart and how they don't really talk anymore. Um, from our own website, it says, PEX aims to enhance the research experience of Princeton graduate students by encouraging them to transcend the boundaries of their field by fostering a sense of broad, common intellectual adventure. Drawing from a broad range of disciplines, PEX students and members of the faculty board have a unique opportunity to thoughtfully approach the multifaceted energy challenges of the 21st century. He even goes on to say how we have humanities and social sciences. And as you saw from the list before, we've kind of drifted away from that. Not intentionally, but we just haven't been attracting those uh, candidates. So this is really a look to people that have perspectives on the history of climate change, 
um, the ethical implications, the cultural implications, all those different aspects that we are lacking from just being so focused on the science side. So we are calling for applicants. We have a deadline March 22nd. Um, the students are typically second or third year uh, graduate students in area research uh, relating to energy and climate, but there have been exceptions made as long as it fits reasonably well. It's a two-year membership. Um, there are monthly and student faculty dinner meetings, which may be a draw to some. Um, and then you have an available $1,000 fund uh, that can go towards research-related costs, uh, uh, conference travel, and there's an annual $15,000 budget for the group as a whole to attend events like Rio or perhaps the trip to India and things like this. So for more information, um, contact you can contact us at pexweb at princeton.edu or visit our website uh, listed there. We also have a poster and flyers up by the entrance um, that has our information on it as well. And I'll leave you this this quote and any questions you have for us we'd be happy to answer. wanted to we're trying to organize a debate on campus between I think it was like the Whig Clio Society and the University Democrats so we're certainly open to fostering that kind of discourse because I think it's important to have that conversation even if you know the larger scientific community is fairly well settled on the idea of climate change being a very real phenomenon but you do have to acknowledge and give respect to people's differing opinions so that they can feel comfortable accepting the scientific information. So um, I think that is something that we definitely try to respect, although you know, all of us are scientists and engineers and obviously um, have very strong reason for agreeing with the scientific consensus that climate change is happening. Um, but yeah, I don't really know what else we can say about that. Thank you very much for your presentation. And I'm very curious about um, how social media, how any of you can speak to whether or not, and perhaps how a, uh, social media contributes to your sense of common intellectual adventure. Especially Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think as the group grows and expands, I mean, there is a lot of interest in putting what we do out there. And um, so Twitter, Facebook, those two pages, they were relatively recent and they've been very well received. Um, we're also very interested in kind of the videos that you, that you just saw. So when we go on a trip, we are going to document everything and kind of put it out there just so other people at other institutions or in other fields can kind of get a good sense of what we're doing. And I think, I think everything that we've done has been pretty well received yeah. um, in the social media outlet. For the Rio Plus 20 conference, we had posted all those videos on YouTube and we had been linking everything through Facebook and we saw a huge spike in viewership at the, on the Facebook page when that happened. We were also posting those videos on a blog for high school students who are interested in climate change and that got a lot of reception also. Yes. So I think we also have a lot of people who have liked our Facebook page who are not at all in academia or have no kind of science or engineering background That's a good and point to you. or like humanities background or anything related to climate and energy. So those people um, have been a really good audience also. Is it difficult to write tweets? <laughs> I have not been writing the tweets. So. I'm not sure who actually takes care of it. It's Mary, yeah. yeah okay. Any other questions?
uh, for those who are in the humanities who are not specifically working on that. That, 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 that is to say, um, asking people who are interested but maybe working on an entirely different uh, uh, project for the sorts of perspectives you want. And I was wondering whether in particular it might be worthwhile to chat about that very thing with the folks from the humanities, with the alumni uh, from the humanities, from the, the group. Um, that's an interesting point. Um, I think that we want to try to keep it as close to um, our, our main goal as possible, but if you look at some of the members we have now, their research isn't exactly, it doesn't say in their topic, oh, this is climate change or this is something to do with energy or something like that. They are, some have a kind of loose connection, but it is through their own interest that um, they are interested in climate change and energy science. So, in a sense, we don't want to turn away any applicants. I think if you have someone in mind or you know people or if you have students or anything that would you think may be interested in this, I think it's tell them about it, urge them to apply. The worst that can happen is that they don't get in. But um, yeah, advertising <laughs> that very breadth among the scientists. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Another thing just to add quickly to that is that the, the activities that the group undertakes is entirely defined by the students who are in the group. So right now, a lot of the things we've been doing are very energy and sort of in engineering and science focused because that's the students in the group right now. But with a bigger humanities intake, I think it would evolve a lot more. Um, so it's flexible. Um, thank you for your uh, presentation. This is really interesting. At Arizona State University, we have a, a large uh, group of um, students interested in climate change, and they're pretty much all in the School of Sustainability. So um, the School of Sustainability uh, is very interested in working with the humanities, and so they're always putting out calls for um, you know, interest from students in the humanities, essentially the same thing that you're doing here today. They're, they put out these calls on their listserv. But I find as a professor in the humanities that, and also I'm a senior sustainability scholar, so I'm, I have affiliations in both places, that when their they're sort of you know, uh, calls for students in the humanities go out, the way that they're worded almost keeps that from happening. And so I always wish, and maybe I need to volunteer, I always wish that there was someone from the humanities sort of working with them on their language so that the language itself would be more attractive to people in the humanities. So here's an example. I have a graduate student who's doing this wonderful project on Frankenstein. And um, if you know the novel, then you know that it, it's just one of the most brilliant pieces of literature ever written. But it's set in what today you know we're sort of referring to as the global north. And without going into a, a whole analysis of Frankenstein here, I can say that this novel is just so prescient for climate change. And so my graduate student is doing this incredible work. But the way that the calls for our school sustainability from the graduate students go out, my student almost can't reply. Does that make sense? So I'm wondering if you have, um, you have professors here that are working with you to do maybe some of the kinds of things I'm suggesting here, just uh, to, 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 to help you think about how to rephrase the calls so that they're, they're more um, uh, friendly to the humanities? That's a really good point. And I think the fact that we are all from hard sciences, it, it's kind of <laughs> hard to put ourselves in the mindset of someone that isn't. So, these, these calls do maybe get a little more technical or maybe they get a little uh, away from what someone in the humanities may be interested in or what may attract them. And this is why I think we're trying to take this uh, stronger initiative to directly attract the humanities. We contacted Ken and we work with, we have other faculty that may not be in the humanities but aren't hard science, they aren't engineering or biology, they're from policy or Woodrow Wilson School. So we are trying to get more uh, diverse outreach and trying to, I think maybe, like you said, maybe uh, 
trying to tweak our wording a little bit may help a lot in uh, attracting those students. So maybe we can actually go back to our call and look at it and really take a look at the language we use to see if there's something that could be more useful. So any humanities? You could actually say, is there anyone working on Frankenstein? <laughs> I'm not joking, there's just a whole list of, of uh, you know, films and literature that you could, you could literally ask, is anybody working on this? Because the addition of those people to your group would just be such a wonderful cross-pollination. So if there are any humanities faculty in the audience who want to volunteer to help us with that. Okay. <laughs> but this has been great. I mean, because really, if you step back, what we're seeing here is a future generation of scientists and engineers on their own, initiating this conversation, trying to bring humanities people in. And um, yeah, to me, it's a really exciting moment, and they are to be commended. Thank you.